as was explained, we are starting a new sermon series, and I won't be preaching the whole thing, just the start right here, uh, but it's all about the church from the book of Acts. All about the church from the book of Acts. Um, I'll be preaching on an expectant church. Expectant. What does it mean to expect something? To be waiting for something? To know something wonderful is going to happen? Well, by way of illustration, let's think of one of the most joyous expectations we can know here on this earth from a human standpoint. How about a child waiting for Christmas? Okay? Everybody has experienced that here, I'm sure. When I was a kid, I was ex as excited for Christmas as anybody else. I have a brother and I have a sister, and once December hit, we would be making plans, we would be writing our list. We always had the same thing at the top of our list every year. Never got it, but that was kind of our thing, just to write that. Uh, a nice little race car track that goes up and around in circles and everything like that. Parents knew wisely that we would tire that easily. So we never got it, but it was always there. And then when the presents started appearing under the tree, we would go there, we would sit underneath, it was in our dining room, and we would take the packages, shake them, give our little assessment of what, what they could possibly be, look forward to what they're going to be when we open them. We always knew which ones held the sweaters, but <laughs> it's the thought that counts. Now, so when Christmas morning came, first thing we do, we wake up and we go out there to the dining room. Now, we had one rule in the house on Christmas morning. We wait till everybody's gathered together at the same time before we open presents, right? But our parents were generous. They allowed us to open our stockings to give them time to wake up. So we would get our stockings down, and we would go through it. There was a pair of socks. There was a, a candy cane in there, um, always an orange at the bottom of the stocking. And then I did what I always do. I made myself a bowl of cereal. And I sat down at the kitchen table and I started eating. This drove my brother and sister nuts because my parents would be out there and ready to open presents but before I was done with my bowl of cereal. But I wasn't about to finish that bowl of cereal early. I enjoyed sitting there eating that bowl and it, oh, you never heard such whining. <laughs> People, you know, hurry up, Corey, finish that. Why do you have to eat that? And I had a reason why I liked to eat that. It wasn't just because that I liked my bowl of cereal in the morning. It wasn't just because of the routine. I enjoyed waiting for those presents to be opened. You see, as long as those presents are under that tree and not open, there's a sense of mystery. There's a sense of, of potential. What could this be? The moment I open those presents, yeah, I would have all the fun of the presents, but that mystery would no longer be there. And so that was important for me to prolong that just as, just as long as I could. Now, as a kid, with all the time in the world, and with nothing that has more kingdom significance than opening up a present, that's fine to just waste your time in idle waiting like I was doing. But we, as Christians, we have something even greater. You grow up and you realize that all of that is just training for that, that great expectation of Jesus' return. And so I knew growing up that there's this something better out there. But we're going to look into Acts chapter 1 and we're going to find out exactly how all of this fits in. You see, the early church lived with an expectation of the imminent return of Jesus. And so, basically saying, the early church was about the business of waiting, so to speak. We are about the business of waiting. But what does it mean to wait? We're going to be learning three things that the apostles waited for. And more importantly, we're going to learn some principles about expectation from what, from what we see in them. So, first we need to ask, what were they waiting for? Well, the first thing that they were waiting for is they waited for the gift of the Holy Spirit. The apostles waited for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 explain this. It says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, this is Jesus, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they knew there was something special going to be happening here. What we learn from the apostles in this passage is that an expectant church understands the value of preparation. An expectant church understands the value of preparation. You see, there is, there is work to be done. And yet, what kind of preparation is needed to receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus promised it would happen, so don't they just need to sit there and wait for it to happen? Well, I suppose that Jesus promised it's going to happen, but you see, the apostles were so in tune with, with Christ at this point. They were so in tune with what He wanted from them, it, they didn't just sit around. Now, as flawed people, we might be tempted to think, you know, what is the least amount of work I can do and still be said of me that I did my responsibility? Right? So yeah, they could have gone and they could have just waited. But they didn't do that. They spent that time in praise and prayer. I'll just read um, Acts um, 1, 13 and 14. It said, when they arrived, they were, went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. See, they didn't just sit there. They prayed. They prayed constantly, 10 days of constant prayer in preparation of something Jesus already promised them. You see, to them, there was something they needed to do. They needed to make sure they were still right. They needed to make sure they were prepared for when that spirit come, when it came. Now, Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China, and um, he had a very successful ministry down there. Um, I read a biography of his one time, um, really fascinating. Um, Hudson Taylor's son had this to say about Hudson Taylor. He said, he prayed about things as if everything depended upon the praying. But he worked also as if everything depended on his working. You see, this was a man who knew he needed to pray. It wouldn't happen without the prayer. But he knew he needed to work because it wouldn't happen without the work as well. So. So preparation, prayer, is a vital preparation for an expectant church. Let's go to the other end. Bible college. I've been there, and I'll tell you, it's, there is a feeling that most, not necessarily all, but most Bible college students get at some point. You know, you've been there two, three, you're on your fourth year, and you think to yourself, I want to be out there doing something. I don't want to be here any longer just reading and studying and planning. I want to be out there using my gifts. If I die today, what difference would I have made in the world? Well, I would hazard to say now that they've made a tremendous difference in the world in the preparation. And yeah, there's things you can do in the meantime, ways you can, you can hook up in, in local ministry. But that preparation, that means something. Jesus didn't start his ministry till he was 30. And even when he started, he went off 40 days into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. You know, that must have been vital preparation for his ministry. But how did him go into the wilderness benefit us in any way? Well, it made him better. It made him stronger. It, 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 but on the other end, you know, we read about that in this word. We read about the account, and we can think to ourselves, okay, yeah, you know, this is, this is what Jesus had to go through. He went through these same trials that, that I go through, and he understands me. That's important. It helps his ministry that we know this about him. In the same way, I think it helps people when they know people are willing to spend four-plus years at Bible college. It helps them when they know that people are preparing themselves for other works of service. You don't have to go to Bible study to minister, and yet there's always sorts of preparation that go on. The person who prepares Sunday school lessons each week, um, people who prepare some of these behind-the-scenes things that you don't see, even just getting ready. If, if, if you don't know this, the, the kids' ministry here, they require everyone who 
takes part in the kids ministry to go through an online training session. It's not terribly long, half an hour, but it's something that teaches us, you know, how to protect the children. You know, how, you know, what types of things to look for in other workers or in other people who are, who are involved with the kids. That's important stuff. It makes us better people, better workers when we prepare. So an expectant church isn't just waiting around. An expectant church is striving to be better at what they'll be able to do. Now, what else did they wait for? The apostles waited to be witnesses to the end of the to the end of the earth. Jesus promised that to them. The apostles waited to be um, witnesses to the end of the earth. In Acts chapter one, verses seven through eight. Just before Jesus arises to heaven, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is what they were waiting for. It was the actual ministry that they were to do. They knew an expectant church doesn't just sit around, you know, waiting for Jesus to return. An expectant church goes about kingdom business. So Jesus pro said that the Holy Spirit would give them power. That power was for a reason. And from that day on, all believers who, gave, who became baptized in Jesus received His Spirit. Those of us here who have been baptized into Jesus, who have given our lives to Him, have received His Spirit. And the same thing is true for us now as it was for them then. That Spirit is for a reason. We have a job to do. Now, if you had to boil down Jesus' message to a single phrase, what would it be? You know, think about that for a moment. And no cheating, no sucking in a lung full of air and seeing how many words spill out before you run out of breath. It has to be a nice, simple, succinct phrase. Now, I like how the New Testament in Matthew phrases it. In Matthew 4.17. Matthew 4.17, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That was his message. Nice, simple, and we can spend a long time unpacking everything that that means. There's a lot of meaning in that phrase. Um, but, it's, but it's a nice, simple phrase to just illustrate what Jesus is, is focused on. So we need to have a focus. We need to have that focus. You know, what is it that we're to be about? Well, if the kingdom work was so important to Jesus, if reaching the lost was so important to Jesus, that's what our work should be about, too. Now, after his resurrection, Jesus had the same topic as his, one of his main topics, the, uh, the, the kingdom of God. But he also talked more about the Holy Spirit, proportionally, than what he did beforehand. So we are to understand that the work of the Holy Spirit with us is now a vital and important part in what we do. As we work in kingdom business, we need the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the difference between a paid staff member of the church and um, somebody who, who just comes to attend the church, really, in my opinion, is just time. A paid staff member is given a job that allows them to spend more time doing the things that all of us need to be doing anyway. And so, everyone, wherever they're at, in their work away from church, can be about kingdom business and can be about that work. The apostles did not just sit around before the Holy Spirit came. And after he came, they certainly didn't just sit around. No, they, they were busy. They were busy doing things. The Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, came upon them it manifested, the Spirit manifested in them in the speaking of tongues, speaking of different languages. It was followed by a powerful sermon by Peter, and that first day, 3,000 people were added to their numbers. That's the kind of thing that could be happening today. It's the kind of thing that didn't stop there. 
You see, the early church was the most vulnerable it was ever going to be. They had the fewest members. Jesus had just left them for good. Some people may not even understood that he had returned from the dead, though there were multiple witness accounts of that. It was the most fragile it would ever be. And they were able to do remarkable things because of their faithfulness to what they were doing, to about the business that they were to be about. Now, the third thing that we learn that they waited for is they were literally waiting for Jesus' return. Okay? An expectant church is expecting something. And this was the event. And I put it here, even though it's also kind of the main broad theme of this message, because we don't want to forget that. We don't want to lose sight of this. Acts 1, 9 through 11. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so they were... The thing we learn about this, about an expectant church from here, is that an expectant church maintains the proper motive, maintains the proper focus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Okay, now, what they thought they were waiting for at the time was Jesus to come with an army of angels and rescue them from Rome and rebuild the community of people there. They didn't, they didn't quite understand. Um, they were still learning, still growing. But in Acts 1-6, it said, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus had greater plans than restoring the kingdom to Israel. He had a kingdom that was for everybody. He had something to offer and include for everybody to be a part of, if only they would accept. So the disciples, Jesus raises into the sky. And the disciples, they're just standing there watching. I don't know how long they stood there before the angels came. I imagine if the angels let them, it would have been a long time. Just not knowing what to do. Where do we go next? You know, he said he's going to come back. We're going to wait for him. And so the angels came and, and, and focused them again. Yes, Jesus is coming. What does that mean? He asked something of you. He asked you to wait for the Spirit, to prepare. He asked you to use the gifts that the Spirit gives you and go about the work of kingdom business, teaching people to repent for the kingdom of God is near. So, yeah, they, they were waiting for Jesus at first, but that's not the right kind of waiting. Waiting for Jesus in that respect can be a waste of time. Who would profit if any one person in this church just goes about their life thinking, someday Jesus is going to come for me. You know, that's great. Jesus will come for you. But what about all those around you? Share what you know. In the parable of the talents, um, Mark preached about the parable of the minas um, a few weeks back. Um, parable of the talents, um, same story, a little bit um, different. Um, but the master goes away. If you remember this, the master was going to go away, left three servants in charge, gave each one a certain amount of money to do something with. And which servant was he unhappy with? The one who buried the money and gave him back the exact same thing. You see, that servant just waited. And you see, the others waited, but they were expectant. They knew this master's coming back, and he wants to see what we do. They invested their money, they got back double, and were able to present the master with something, saying, this is what we did with what you gave us. And so, it's not enough for us to just sit on the sidelines and wait for Jesus to come, but to actually go about what he wanted for us. And the, and the apostles did that from that first day. They spent that time in constant prayer. Some of that prayer was in looking for a new replacement for Judas. In Acts 1, 15, 26, 15 through 26, 
says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, group numbering 120, said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field, in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So note, you know, despite the fact that there were 12 disciples, there were many other people who had been with them the whole time. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Jesus left to go where he belongs. Then, when, then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. So they're praying, but they're also still planning. They're also still making and preparing things for Jesus when he comes back. Jesus promised this would happen. The work that they're doing is, is important. Now, I've heard sermons on both sides. Some saying that, yeah, well, the Holy Spirit was coming. There was no need to cast lots. And really, Paul is the twelfth apostle. And others saying, no, no, no. There's, you know, Matthias, you know, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. Casting lots was still a viable way of figuring out God's will. You know, I'm, I'm less concerned with with that than with the fact that they are being faithful with what they know. And sometimes I think we miss that. Sometimes I think we're so afraid of doing something wrong that we choose to do something not at all. And that doesn't work. That doesn't benefit anybody. I have made plenty of mistakes in my life, in my ministry, that still had fruit. And I think the, act that, the fact that, that we work through these things can be a blessing to other people. Non-Christian in the world out there, they're not looking for perfection. They're looking for love and they're looking for grace. And we can show that with that willingness to do something, even if it's difficult or hard. So, the three things that we learned through the apostles here about an expectant church. An expectant church understands the value of preparation. An expectant church goes about kingdom business and an expectant church maintains proper motive. So these are the things that we know we need to be about. Really, the rest of the book of Acts and the New Testament in general is an account of believers going about the kingdom business, business of God, as they wait for Jesus to return. Now, by example, when my wife and I were in Tokyo, we were involved with another team. Now, a little bit about expectation here on our part is we were told that a third, a third family will be coming to join our team. So right now we have two families and we're waiting for this third and everybody's excited. Well, it fell to our team leader to decide how they transition in. And following some very traditional missionary customs, um, he arranged for their language learning and study to be done elsewhere, not in Tokyo, so that they wouldn't get bogged down in all the stuff that's going on in the ministry and therefore not really learn the language. It, it, it happens. People just get so excited to serve that they forget to prepare. So they, so they went to the interior of Japan to a language school. Well, um, over that period of time, um, the year or so that they were there, they were studying, they were learning, and in their downtime, they were getting involved with the local church and helping out. And the result was that they fit into that church. They found a ministry that exceeded what they had planned on. 
you see, before you go to the field, you have this general idea of what ministry is going to be like. Um, I had told myself when I go there, no English teaching. Guess what I did more of than anything else when I was in Japan? Because it just fit with what I was doing there. So our, our would-be teammates ended up um, not coming to Tokyo, not joining us, and working elsewhere. Now, to some degree, our team mourned that loss. We were really looking forward to this family coming by and helping us out. We, 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 knew, th we knew them during that time. It's not like we didn't meet with them. And we, would, we just knew we would be a really good fit together. And problem, a problem could have arisen if we put our human plans first. But we didn't. You see, my wife and I, we mourned the fact that our human plans were a bit off-centered. We, we weren't... You know, we, we, God's will was made evident in what was going on, and we actually rejoiced with them that they found something that fit that calling God had for them in their lives. So, going about God's business as we await Christ's return can take us places we don't expect. Now, not everybody goes overseas. Um, there's plenty of things to do around where we are, but the important thing is that you are open to what he wants and you see around you, you see where that will take you. Maybe that will take you across the world. Maybe that will take you across the street. But we have to be willing to follow where the Spirit's going. The mark of being expectant is in following where the Spirit leads you.